Welcome, everybody. Um, I'll switch the presentation, but I hope you've been enjoying the jokes. Um, programming jokes are important because they're kind of a shared cultural heritage. Uh, it's all about you know being the in crowd because you found them funny the first time. You usually don't find them funny a second time. Um, although you know there's two problems. There's only one joke, and uh, it's not funny. Um, on to the presentation. So continue finding the sheets, but I'm just going to get started. Um, my name is Peter Hilton, and I'm going to talk to you about universal bugs today. Um, please follow me on Twitter. That would make me happy. Uh, a few more followers for, for a day. Um, also, I've just tweeted the uh, slides for this presentation and the URL for the articles. So lots of the slides link to a blog post. Um, they're at this URL. You don't have to photograph all the slides, although you can, because that's nice on the socials. So please do that as well. But if you just want to read more, then uh, go to Twitter and find the link there. This presentation is is about bugs. And I thought I wasn't going to have to worry about bugs anymore because I did a career switch about five years ago. Um, I stopped writing code and now I work as a product manager. And as a product manager, I was thinking, I don't need to think about bugs other than prioritizing fixing them and checking that they're fixed. Um, I do, by the way, highly recommend a zero bug policy. The correct number of open bugs is zero or one. Uh, fix those first. But not all of the bugs go away. So we usually fix the bugs, but some just kind of, they stay. And they not only stay in your software, you, you change projects, you have a new product, you change jobs, you turn up to a new company, and you see the same bug again. Some bugs are widespread, endemic in our industry. Um, and they don't seem to go away. And as a product manager, I sort of grapple with this now because I realize that it's more than just a technical problem. So my question for this presentation is, how might we more systematically not have these bugs in our software? I'm going to start with an easy example that no one really gets wrong in general, but a lot of us have maybe done it wrong the first time. House numbers. So house numbers, you know, in an address, they are numerical, they're ordered, they're sequential, of course, except when they are none of those things. Um, you know, or at least even start with a digit, also except when they don't. So this is the street that I lived on when I was about five years old, um, near Brighton, south coast of England. That's my grandmother looking out of the door there. And on this street, none of the houses have numbers. Each house has a different name, and if you could read it, it's not a very good photo. This is from for, before digital cameras were invented. Um, it says the boathouse. The name of the house is just the boathouse, name of the street. Addresses in this country are nightmarish because you can't make assumptions like there's going to be a house number. And when you start modeling an address in your software, you might make those kinds of assumptions. And then it, computer says no. You know, somebody somewhere is going to try and type in an address and they're not going to have a good day. If they're lucky, they can fix it with a phone call or make it work somewhere else. But this kind of thing is annoying at best. But I have an early tip for you. House number might be your attribute name in your data model. And any time an attribute has the word number, it's text. Every single time. So the takeaway here is not that house numbers are the evil bug, but more that they are not an exception. There are lots of other kinds of numbers that are not really numbers. Um, if you are confused right now or you want to know more about that, the Google search is nominal number. That's what you're missing. Anyway, so addresses are messy, and that's why um, postal services invent postcodes, because postcodes are obviously completely sensible and well-organized and universal. Um, so obviously they're not. Um, but most of the countries in the world have postcodes. Um, and most of them, so some don't, the gray areas on the map, but most of the countries with postcodes just use digits, which is very easy to model and use. Um, there are a small number of exceptions. And Coincidentally, I grew up in this country and then a while back emigrated to the Netherlands, which is one of the other green countries where we have letters as well as numbers in the postcodes. Um, most of the European postcodes are a little bit more structured, um, you know, with a hierarchy of geographic regions. Who even knows how anything works in, in the UK? Postcodes are kind of complicated. But never fear, because in this country you have the path, the 
post um, the postcode address file is just the data set that you have to buy if you're doing things like taking customer orders over a phone. And these are the correct addresses. You know, and I remember moving to moving house in, in Surrey many years ago to an address where it was something like flat three, 12 Cavendish Road. And it was complicated until I figured out what is the correct way to say my address so that the person I'm talking to sees the same thing on their screen after I've told them the postcode. There is an official list. And so in this country, I'm not sure if this is cheating or genius, but postcode is an enumerated type with 330 million values. This is just a brute force data model power move. I think this is great. Um, Many countries just use digits, though, of different lengths. Um, so when I was going down this rabbit hole and reading about the Universal Postal Union, which has all of the member countries, most of which have postcodes, um, I, I did discover that Ireland has updated their situation recently. Um, when my dad moved to Ireland 20 years ago, lives in a small village, there was no sort of house address other than his name and the name of the village, and then the post, the, you know, the delivery people, they have to know who lives where. But now... Irish postcodes are unique per delivery address. Um, that's the way it should be everywhere. It just seems now such as annoying to realize, you know, the rest, of, the rest of us have to deal with house number and postcode and try and find it on the list. So postcodes are mostly good, but, you know, this is the designed, carefully designed solution to the delivery address problem. And it's different in every country and it's a bit complicated. And there were all sorts of weird exceptions and, you know, postcodes that are not adjacent and lots or too few houses with the same postcode. Um, if you're lucky, you're writing software for this country and there's the official list that you have to buy. It's probably expensive. Hopefully it's not your money. Um, for other countries, you sort of need the up-to-date list, but having an up-to-date one in some countries is, well, good luck with that. That's all I can say. Countries. Um, so countries are kind of the next step in your international delivery you know, world. Um, countries should be easier because there aren't so many of them. But countries are kind of problematic because how many countries are there even? And, and what even is a country? I mean, they don't appear when you photograph the planet because a country is a political construct, that the borders don't appear on the photograph. You know, we draw them somewhere. So not only are countries political constructs, but constructs, but choosing a list of countries is in itself a political act. So in this particular rabbit hole, you immediately discover that by country, the Wikipedia page you really want is sovereign state. And many of them have you know, unique codes in the ISO 3166 um, Alpha 2 standard. These are the two letter codes that are quite familiar. But a lot of sovereign states are not recognized by everybody. And so this is sort of hierarchy of how many other sovereign states recognize your sovereign state. Um, are the United Nations members kind of in on this or not? Do you have a flag in the Apple emoji character set? Um, so four of them don't even, which is, um, you know, it's, it's not very inclusive. And there are, you know, difficult discussions about which countries to include on a list. So if you need to have a list of countries you need to choose that kind of carefully and, you know, make some choices about what to include, what to exclude, depending on your audience and the political implications of um, including different countries. Now, the, um, these country codes kind of help with the list, but they're not technically country codes, they're regions. Many of them are not actual countries. Some of them are um, just regions in a country or islands that belong to a country. Uh, but mostly, this helps a lot, especially with um, data modeling and avoiding nasty bugs with not, getting, not being clear about what a country is. So these standards help. You can use those. Um, similarly, for the currency codes, uh, in case you didn't notice, the currency codes always start with a two-letter country code. Um, I somehow would always miss that. Um, and then, of course, the language codes, which we all know are lowercase. We never mix up the country codes and the language codes. We remember, of course, the EN in lowercase. I mean, some countries and languages, they sort of have both. So Dutch is NL lowercase. The Netherlands is NL uppercase. Um, that shouldn't be confusing at all. Just, just don't get it wrong. Otherwise, you'll confuse people. So mostly, you know, this gets easier. And these bugs that we have with sort of inconsistent um, addresses... They're helped when we use these standards. So that's mostly good. Country names are a little bit trickier, but you know, if you're starting with the region code, then you're along the right lines. 
But of course, sooner or later, you're, you know, you're working on some bit of software and then some, some bright salesperson starts selling it in other countries and you want to start localization. And so somebody says, okay, just, just translate the, the country list um, in the user interface. So what do you do if you need to provide these translations? Um, a lot of translation is quite subjective if you're translating a novel, but translating a list of countries is something that you can very much get wrong. So don't get this wrong. Fortunately, you don't have to redo this. So this has been done before by the Unicode Common Locale Data Repository Project, which has this beautifully, unironically retro website like it's 1995. I mean, it, at least it doesn't have a gray background, but it's, it's not far off. And this is a data set of localization information for many languages. So this is where you go if you want a list of country names or currencies or months of the year or days of the week um, in different languages by language code and gives you with confidence the correct spellings in the correct alphabets of these country names. So... Again, the standards, when they work together, in this case, um, Unicode standards working together with the ISO standards, let you not have to you know, do this work the hard way. And this helps you avoid this whole class of bugs where you're just getting these lists inconsistent and wrong. So this is about, you know, this is the good news. This is about as good as it gets um, in this talk. Um, there's even more good news. The native data set is um, XML because 20 years old. Um, Unicode is even older than that, but but now they, they generate JSON versions as well, so you don't have to see the XML that cannot be unseen. You're okay. Um, and they've got GitHub projects. Um, super convenient. There's a bonus bug uh, when you're dealing with country names, though, and having these lists. You can have bugs. There are bugs in this mock-up. You know, as a PM, I've done a mock-up here and I've done it wrong. And anybody who's looking for, I don't know, the United Kingdom and a website in French eventually realizes that you're not going to have to look under R. You're going to have to look under U because that's where it's sorted in English. So the bug here is that the sort order is not being updated for the different languages. Because remember, it's not only the spelling that changes in another language, the sort order changes as well. So don't do this. Um, French is very much in the wrong order there. Ukrainian, I have no idea because I'm, I just can't read the Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, so you've got to get this right as well. Um, the, the way of sorting works, obviously it's country specific. So I, I might need to say that a few times today. In the end, everything is country specific. Um, that's why international travel is so much fun. So for sanity's sake, you'd think at least email addresses are not country specific. They're not, thankfully, um, and nicely standardized. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, the problem with email addresses is, is that there isn't a standard. There are many standards that sort of overlap and obsolete each other, and they get progressively more complicated. And the email address format itself is just way more complex than, than what we really need. So there, there are several problems you get with email addresses. One is that, that it's hard to validate that an email address is correct because there are weird things that the standard allows that in practice, the only people who use them are the security researchers and the hackers. Um, so you're actually better off not supporting in your software every valid email address because some of the weird ones you know, might allow vulnerabilities that you weren't really thinking about because you've never actually seen an email address like that. You can validate the format to some degree, but a valid format email address might have a non-existent domain. So is that definitely not going to work because that domain isn't registered? That's a different level of checking. And email address validation ultimately means sending an email and seeing if the correct person gets it. So unless you've actually done a, a validation link in an email that you've sent, then you haven't really validated the email address yet. So that, oh, how do we validate an email address? It's just a regular expression is not enough. It can be wrong in additional ways. Um, and that's, that's even before we get into the fact that if you have a regular expression to validate email addresses that are correct according to the standards, um, that's not really what you should do. There is a Java library that does email address validation in stages according to the spec, and it will generate the regular expression that it uses. Um, which is, uh, I found this on GitHub. It's, uh, it's a thing of beauty. And um, that's not all of it, obviously, so I have to let the slides go. Um, so I'm just going to have a drink of water while this. Uh... Good luck debugging that. 
um, it's on GitLab, GitHub, uh, linked on the slides. So addresses have these kind of corners and there are plenty of things to get wrong here. And these are things, as I said, that you can get wrong on every bit of software you ever work on in your whole career. So I urge you to think a little bit about how to make this, these kinds of problems, um, getting these things wrong less common. Anyway, that was the warm up. Those were the easy bugs, the, the less difficult problems, because at least we might understand them and sort of agree how to solve them. And in practice, once we actually spend some time on it in you know, version three of the software, then we can fix those. So those are the easy ones, now for a hard one. Personal names is the hard one. And it shouldn't be hard because people have been around for a really long time, a lot longer than computers in any case. So three of the speakers at uh, today's conference um, are from the Netherlands, including myself, but also Marit and Simona. Um, these are the, I know them from the Netherlands. There are more Dutch speakers, but it's, uh, that's enough for the slide. So in the Netherlands, we also have you know, names, given names and family names. So it's not that different to here. You know, that's the, that's the takeaway from the Netherlands. It's mostly the same as the UK. It's not as, it's not as weird as going to other European countries. But it's already a little bit different. And so what Marriott and Simona have is a last name that has two words. And there's this shorter word at the start, which is called a tussefussel. Tussefussel is Dutch for the, the bit in the middle. And when you're a native English speaker like me, working on a development team in the Netherlands, sooner or later, somebody is going to ask you, how do we say that in English, you know, for our data model? And it took me a while to figure out that the correct answer is, no, do not include this in your data model. Do not s chop up people's names into little bits and expect that to work and be useful because, you know, that's really country specific. Um, so in, in Dutch language sort order, this is alphabetical order by surname because you do not sort on the small word. You sort on D, G, H. So this is the order we should appear in. Um, in other countries, it could be a bit different. So for example, um, so in, in, in Dutch, Marit van Dijk um, appears under D. Um, in Belgium and the US, they would sort that under V and probably capitalize the V and, and start the surname there. And on the, on the DevOps speaker website, I have no idea what happened here because I saw Marit last in the list um, coming after Marcus Zilla. Uh, and I, I thought, what's going on here? Oh, I guess it's probably different in Belgian. You know, DevOps is a Belgian thing, right, originally. So maybe that's it. Look at the Wikipedia page and, and no, it should be sorted under V. So I have no idea what's going on here. But also I recognize this is just wildly difficult to always get right in practice. Like how would you do this correctly in practice? It's, you know, it's difficult. Um, how did Marit end up last? You know, the, that place belongs to, uh, belongs to Marcus. Maybe it's case sensitive, you know, and it's sorting lowercase last, which is also odd. We get used to these kinds of things. And, and in the famous blog post, Falsehoods Programmers Believe About Names, Patrick McKenzie, who's better known on, as Patio 11 around the internet, wrote a long list of things we think might be true, but turn out not to be true, but we were just kind of trying to get the user story done and, and the pull request merged. And it's more complicated than that. But in particular, in this list, he devotes four separate entries to the falsehood that our system won't have to deal with names that come from these other countries. Um, but if you think about it a little bit, this is a wildly wrong assumption because people move countries and emigration has been around for longer than computers. And so in every country, you have people with names from every country. And so even if your software is only used in one country, you will have to deal with all sorts of names. And it's, it's a bit frustrating if your name is in the wrong place or you're trying to find somebody in a list and they're not where you expected them and then you, you know, have to hope that the search works and then find them in a weird place on the list. So I sympathize because this is very hard to fix. This is very hard to avoid. And it's very hard to change because we have this sort of orthodoxy of first name plus, first name plus last name, and that's going to be okay. But it's not inclusive. And it's essentially a little bit racist that we are ignoring 
um, names of people from other countries and not handling them equally. This is something that we can do better. And so there are World Wide Web Consortium guidelines about how to deal with names. It's not that it's complicated, it's just that it's different and you have to be more inclusive. You basically have to allow anything. Very long names, very short names, one letter, 100 letters, digits, digits at the start of the name, all sorts of weird stuff. And just, just treat it as this opaque string, this opaque bit of text, and don't do anything else with it. And if you want to say hi, Peter, in an email, then ask me for a separate, you know, what do you want us to call you? How should we address you? I mean, maybe I want to be called, hey, you look nice today. Or something else, you know, or, or I've got a nickname that is not really anywhere in my official name because when I was a kid, my mum used to call me Pedro, and I have no idea why. But here we are. So have different fields for different purposes, purposes like sorting and salutation, but also preserve the full name if you need the full name. What happens if you don't do this? Well, guess what? Your name is one of the most personal things about you, and so people take it personally. Um... I encourage you to follow Your Name is Valid on Twitter, which posts screenshots of software that is telling somebody that either their name is not valid or that they, as a person, are not valid. This is not a friendly, inclusive way to code your software. Um, Stephen might not want to buy this product. It's personal. Personal names are personal. Um, and it gets worse. Actually, so, I mean, personal names, we could fix this. Um, what about gender? So we get problems like this in software as well. What's wrong with this form field? Um, the short answer is that there's more than one thing wrong with this form field. Uh, so I'll take them in reverse order. But I would like to just to frame this in the context of this presentation. I would like to consider this a bug in your software. And it depends on the context. But in most contexts, um, two is not the correct number of options. So, you know, for, for the love of all of the sacred, don't model that as a Boolean. But actually, that's not the most important bug with that form field. In most software, you should not even ask the question. I mean, I, I hope this doesn't sound at all radical, but please build unisex software. You know, software that's easily good for boys and for girls. And even if you don't want to do this for moral grounds, do this because the GDPR tells you that it is illegal not to. Gender is personal data. Personal data must only be collected if it is necessary for the purposes. You must implement data min minimization. And despite Brexit, this is still in force in the UK. And if you have customers in the EU, this matters. Don't collect data that you don't need. And the fact that marketing wants it is not a good enough reason, typically. I checked this, I checked this with a lawyer friend of mine. I said, you know, well, what advice should I give people? Should I say, if in doubt, talk to your company's lawyer? He laughed at me. He said, you can't do that. I said, why not? They're the company lawyer. Surely that's what they're for. And he said, no. No, your company's lawyer, your general counsel, has no time for questions about details in your software or in your data model. Your company's lawyer is overflowing with work on customer contracts, and they're just doing contract law. And they're probably specialized in contract law and wouldn't actually know what to do here anyway. So who's going to sort this out? Um, I mean, it, it's sort of logical to me that this kind of issue is a product management issue. This is a you know functionality in the software. Um, and you would at least want that to happen. But a lot of the bugs I'm talking about today are perhaps too technical for the product manager. So I think in the end, you know, you are the people who are most likely to get this right or prevent it being wrong. This is for every developer and especially for the tech leads to do the right thing in the software because nobody else is going to, you know, make you do the right thing. And it gets even worse than this if you're collecting unnecessary gender in combination with address data, and you sort of end up noting the gender of people who live together, you might accidentally have a proxy for sexual orientation, which is protected data under the GDPR, special category data. And that's even worse if you have it but shouldn't. Bigger fines, more badness. So don't do this. So build unisex software. Don't ask people their gender, including gendered titles. You know, otherwise we can all be doctors because that's about the only non-gendered, and that's only non-gendered because everybody used to think it meant man anyway. 
you need to learn enough about the GDPR. Like that, that text I quoted was the literal text of the legislation. Um, and understand what data minimization is. You know, it's not that it's hugely complicated. The problem is that most people are trying to avoid, you know, you mentioned GDPR and lots of people look at their shoes, including the lawyers. And don't limit, you know, don't limit input to two options. So your homework is to think of a bit of software where the best solution is for gender to be a free text field and optional. Okay, um, let's move on. Um, telephone numbers. I don't want to spend a lot of time on telephone numbers because they're extremely boring, but I just want to mention it for sort of completeness, the, the thing. So the problem with telephone numbers is that obviously they're not numbers, but you knew that because I warned you about things being called a number not being a number earlier. There are two reasons why telephone numbers are not numbers. First, they have this sort of punctuation, spaces, dashes and stuff, which you may or may not want. Um, but also they have significant leading zeros. So if you put them in a numeric type, you tend to lose those and then have the wrong number. So it's text. But this does introduce a problem that you might see with other bits of data like email addresses, that there is more than one representation. And so now you need to get into the tricky area of deciding what you allow people to type in and what you store. And maybe in the ideal world, you would always store the numbers in the same format such as the bottom right URI format for telephone numbers, which has no spaces in or no grouping. But you don't really want to display it like that because that's not friendly, really. But how do you translate the two? That's, that's tricky. I thought the standards will save us. Well, the standards are even more boring than the ISO standards and um, about things like email addresses. And they just sort of recommend that you should maybe use grouping, but how you do it is up to local preferences. Um, use spaces at the very least. So all of the brackets and dashes are um, a bit unnecessary. The weirdest telephone number country, by the way, is Italy, I think, because landline numbers can vary in length from six to 11 digits. How cool is that? No consistency. The problem in a lot of other countries is that the grouping sort of depends on what is considered the area code. And in this country, the sort of notional area code varies you know, they change from year to, well, from decade to decade, the length changes, and sometimes it's three or four or five, I, I don't even know. So you'd probably need a list of all of them to be able to correctly group on that. Um, I'm not really sure how you would solve that, but there is a Google library for Android that I think just knows about all of countries' address formats for formatting numbers for telephones, which I guess they wrote for telephones. So telephone numbers, um, it's a mess, uh, like all of the other things that are a mess, and you're going to get them wrong, and you're going to have bugs in the software, and then you might decide to fix it. You would at least think that bank account numbers are going to be fine, because now we have these modern standards like IBAN, the international bank account number. And the international bank account number, if you are a, a, an identification number standards nerd, um, I'm sure none of you really are, but, but know that it has a, a proper standard. It's got check digits so that it can you know, tell if you accidentally transpose two digits, you know, put them in the wrong order, or if you get a digit wrong, um, the checksum will break and it will not be valid, and there's an algorithm that's published that everybody can use, uh, you know, and it's widely used in, in Europe and, and North Africa and the Middle East and, and the Caribbean and, and not used in most of the world. So global adoption is not one of the benefits of using IBAN. Um, and again, this is often the story that um, you know, we, we have sort of competing standards. Um, I, I'm sure you know the XKCD cartoon. And we come up with a better way of organizing things so that we don't have to make these bugs. But then it doesn't get widely adopted. And so now you need that standard as well as all of the other edge cases as well anyway. But, you know, where you do have these standards in use, they often wipe out a whole class of bugs because they just prevent you getting it wrong. There is a correct way to model IBAN and you can look it up. So this has helped a lot within in Europe, where it's widely used. Um, I have some um, bonus numbers. They're not really going to be bugs, um, because I'm guessing you're not working on aircraft software. But it, it's the same problem. Um, I just liked it because I like the picture. So aircraft have tail numbers. They're called tail numbers because they are sometimes on the tail of the aeroplane, except when they're not. Um, here it's on the side of the aeroplane and underneath the wing here. And they're called numbers, but who even knows why they're called numbers? Um, in the Netherlands, 
well, so they, they always have two parts. They start with a country code and then a dash and then some kind of local registration. The country code horrifyingly is not an ISO uh, region code. I mean, that's because they're too old. They're from more than 100 years ago. Um, and it gets worse. So you, you might think that H would be for Holland and you'd be right. And it used to be just H, but then Hungary complained that it might be confusing. Um, and so they added the P to make it less confusing. So all Dutch planes have a PH at the start as the country code. Um, and that's the short version of the story. If I expanded, it would get even worse. Um, and um, commercial aircraft in the Netherlands don't use digits. If there's digits, it's a glider. So if you if you want if you want to you know if you're flying to Amsterdam and you look out and you see digits on the wing, you're in a glider, and I'm not sure you're going to make it. Um, okay. Right. So um, for the second hour of my presentation, I'm going to exclusively talk about time zones. Um, no, I'm obviously kidding. I'm, I'm not even going to go here because this topic is too appalling bad. And also, um, we have John Skeet, and John Skeet has done the correct presentations on all of these. So if you want to know more about time zones, go and watch John Skeet's conference presentations, or better, in person, um, online. Very good. Um, I think there's a book as well. Anyway, so following these examples, I would like to kind of break down a bit you know, what is going on here with different kinds of bugs and why I think it's useful to think about some of them differently. So for the purposes of this conversation, the least interesting kind of bugs are the easiest ones to fix. These are the, the programming errors where the programmer or their cat mistyped on the keyboard and it was just the wrong it was a plus sign instead of a minus sign. It was an off by one error, or it was a not enough coffee and an off by one error. So in this example, I've got a list of classical music composers from the 16th century who um, uh, wrote uh, choral music to be performed in ch uh, cathedrals. And we roughly know when they were born. So imagine I've got a website, and this is the user interface. The, the thing that is sort of wrong here is that we intended to sort these in ascending order of year of birth, and it's just the wrong way around. It's just, it's just a, you know, a typo in the code. It should have been the other way around. These are straightforward to fix. You can avoid them by testing. You can encode these expectations in your software, and we don't suffer from these too much because we prevent most of them, and when we find them, the fix time is very short because they're straightforward to fix. So this is not usually much of a problem. Um, for the record, if this were a UX talk, I wouldn't have an upwards arrow to indicate ascending order. Um, but you know, maybe that's the cause. Like There was a bit of a miscommunication about what the user interface meant. And the developer, for one reason or another, thought that meant descending order. You know, so maybe it was a UX bug. So programming errors, not so bad. Um, something that happens all the time in software is that just nobody said how the table should be sorted. You know, it wasn't the most interesting thing or a reason to delay the meeting or be late for lunch. So nobody said and nobody wrote the code and nobody put a, you know, a, a sort clause on the database query or sorted the collection in, in the application code. And then the table's in random order. In my book, random order in a user interface or in any external interface, including an API, is always a bug. Random order is never the correct order. So in general, don't do this. Not specified means that a conversation between the developer and somebody else should have happened but didn't. And again, it is easy to fix as the other one, add the sort order, um, but still a bug. Usually not a very serious one. Um, easiest one to find. First thing I'll look at if I'm uh, looking at a software release, do I find any easy bugs to report like this? A slightly more subtle bug is when the software looks fine, it's all super consistent. It's just not what we should have because it's not the most useful thing for the software to do. And this is more of a kind of a product management bug. Um, everybody uh, discussed putting the composers in ascending order, and it turns out that that's not helpful for the customer or the user. Um, so I have a lot of this sheet music at home, and I've got this giant jewelry cabinet um, with sheet music and drawers, and it's handy because there's lots of small drawers, so I've got lots of paper in these. But obviously, it's a bit of a problem to find it. Now, I don't sort this stuff by date. That would be appalling, because I can't remember when they were all born. So this is obviously sorted alphabetically. 
Um, so sorting up by date would be perhaps reasonable from a technical point of view, but from a usability point of view or from a customer need point of view, um, not the right solution. And that's relatively easy to fix through a conversation with your product person or a customer interview. You know, again, it happens, it's not the end of the world, but we do need to fix these bugs. So what I've focused on today is much more bugs that are the wrong model. They're deeper because we have the wrong way of building our software. We're sorting it by last name, but we've just done it slightly naively and not take into account of the fact that Palestrina and Joscan de Play would normally be found under P, and that's where they are in my cabinet. And it takes a bit of thought to figure out how to fix this. And so I kind of know technically what the solution is, that you need to have a separate database field for the sort order. You kind of have to do it case by case. You need a separate field, which is Palestrina, comma, da, I guess. Um, Microsoft Outlook does this. I don't, you don't see this done correctly very often. And it is more effort. You know, fixing this bug is more effort, and that's the first problem. It's not just, oh, tweaking something and doing it a different way. It's actually putting in more effort. And also, that more effort often means that we don't want to focus on that. And as a product manager, then, I might think, oh, do we really have to spend the effort on that? Does that really have the impact? It becomes a subjective decision. And perhaps that's why this kind of bug and the wrong addresses um, they persist in our software because the real world is that messy. So the difference between these four kinds of bugs is who can fix them and what they have to do to fix them. If this were a agile software development presentation, I wouldn't make this distinction, perhaps not even between bugs and user stories, just do the work, make the software good. But if you need to fix these kind of problems, then it's worth acknowledging that we have categories here of, of bugs that are just harder, just, just harder to make go away. And in particular, the first name, last name thing, the how do you stop this happening in your software? I know how to fix it technically, but I failed at fixing it organizationally. The last piece of software I worked on, it had the first name, last name thing, and it propagated through other systems. And we have international customers. And you know, I was just waiting for the awkward conversation where I have to explain to a customer that I know the software is wrong and I know that it's mangling your name. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we haven't fixed this. So I don't really have the complete solution for you. Um, but figuring out how is, is then a job for all of us. So to summarize, there are lots of things that we can do right once we know what right is and we know how to do them. So for personal names, don't try and split them up. Don't try and standardize them. Don't try and ever say that a personal name is not valid. Because if you want to say that a name is not valid, you'll be making some assumption and it'll be wrong, including that somebody has a name. Depending on what your software is, there are scenarios where somebody does not have a name. Email addresses take multiple steps to validate. Um, is this potentially a correctly formatted email address? Does the domain exist? Is it the correct person? Um, should we allow this format, you know, have a chat with your security team? Build Unisex software. Sort of not hard, but hard. No excuse for it anymore, getting it wrong. Um, use ISO codes and other standards where you find them because they tend to encapsulate a lot of careful thought about how the world is. Um, and usually result in making your software less buggy and more inclusive. So finding out about these is generally, uh, generally good. Um, it's, it's not very user-friendly, but this Unicode CLDR project has a lot of data if you need to have your software in multiple languages. It's great for that. And it will save you a lot of translation effort, and it will save you translation bugs and doing things that you know, are embarrassing. You've got some weird typo in Thursday in Hungarian, say. Um, and if you ever have to choose a country list, ideally don't choose or, well, you, you, there's potential for awkward conversations there. So just beware. And um, things that are called numbers are text. Just, just remember that. I mean, if you learn nothing else today, then that will you know, save you uh, lots of time in your career. Um, so to summarize all of this, um, there are bugs that we're not going to fix within the programming mindset. And you need to have a broader conversation 
about the world with the world with more people and and this is this is why modeling is is more than just the kind of the the boxes and arrows part of data modeling you know the deeper part of data modeling is what does this bit of data mean and and what values can it have Everything, everything is nightmarish as soon as you start doing multiple countries. But most of all, it's not only language. There are, there are so many other little details. The death by a thousand cuts of localization. Um, a, a recent story, I was, uh, there's a company that has some software that's used in 10 countries. It's, it's in 10 languages. Everything seems fine until one day everybody finds out that the sales team has gone and sold it in Japan without giving anybody warning. And suddenly it's got to work in Japan, you know, in two months' time. So, you know, everybody kind of sorts out the language translation and thinks it's okay. And there's a problem with money because apparently it only needed one person, but there wasn't at least one person on the, in the engineering department who happened to know that Japanese yen currency amounts do not include decimals. The number of decimal places for Japanese yen is zero, and the money fields had two decimal places. Major problems, not accepted, launch delayed, you know, money cost. And so that, you know, it's these little details that you'll, you'll make the mistake once and then you'll know. And so this is why in the JDK, the currency class has a property for the number of decimal places per currency. And sure, it's usually two, except when it's zero, one, or in odd cases, three. That's the thing. So localization is always worse than you think. Also, every additional country has a new issue that you didn't have before. Like you start in English and everything's fine. Then you go to the Netherlands and suddenly all of the text is 50% longer. And the, somebody's spacebar seems to be broken and you, know, you don't have space for the text. And then you go to Japan, you have the currency issue. Um, you go to a right to left language and then your whole user interface is the wrong way around and that's got some weird edge cases. Um, you, you know, and you've got new alphabet. So each new country is a, a new set of uh, engineering challenges. Standards can help, but they don't always help entirely. Um, you know, we have standardized numbers for things we're quite familiar with, like ISBN book numbers. Did you know there is also an international standard wine number for your wine, um, similarly for sheet music? Um, but yeah, you know, your mileage may vary. I haven't had an excuse to use the wine number in my software. Um, don't assume that somebody else is going to fix this stuff. I think this is the toughest lesson for me in this topic, that somebody should fix that sounds reasonable but is not going to help and but this is also where as a software developer anywhere in a cross-functional team you can have a real influence you can stick your hand up in that meeting and say that's not going to work or it's going to work but it's you know got this trade-off it's not going to be a good experience for people outside this country that kind of thing um, and this is specialist knowledge uh, you know, as you grow as a developer, there's more about just knowing the language. There's this sort of broader set of skills about the world out there and how it relates to software, um, which will survive longer than any particular JavaScript framework that has a lifetime of a week. And so, you know, in the, in the contemporary way of phrasing this, these are socio-political and socio-technical problems. They're not merely technical problems. Um, that's all of the presentation. Um, we have seven minutes for questions. So there's a microphone. If you have a question, uh, stick your hand up. Okay, we have questions here first. Uh, run with the microphone. Well, um, we want the microphone for the recording. Yeah, I just, I work with delivery systems. So this, this talk, I, I've done a lot of those problems, but I think it's also a great case for having culturally diverse teams, if you would, because I'm born, I, I live in, well, I live in Wales, I was born in Poland. You know, I have a substantial amount of experience of how different a lot of those things are. The alphabet in Poland is much more expanded than most places. There are challenges with that. There's also the problem that if you're within UK, England, Great Britain, whatever you want to call it, there are specific differences. And some people get very upset if you call their country an administrative region. And there is a number of issues that you're just not going to see if everybody you work with is a person from London from the same street. And it's an interesting case that you do get a lot of these if you work with people that are just more diverse. Yeah, so excellent point. I should have had a slide for it. It should go without saying, but maybe it doesn't. Diverse teams are better, people. Don't all be the same. Um, same place. <laughs> so. I'll just say it right here. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, yeah, it's, I just wanted, so something that's always bugged me whenever I put my email in is that often it'll say it's wrong because it, and it's because I've typed a trailing space. Has anyone else, do you, do you know why that's the case? Because I think somehow like it just re, no, it's because it, yeah. I um, think, I think, but I think sometimes like there's some things which it will allow and some things where it won't. I just wondered if you had. The anything. generic answer to your question, and, and yeah, I understand I that it bugs you. I see what you did there, good pun. Um, the, the general problem is that email addresses are just weirdly complicated. And you're typing your email address correctly, probably, and somebody's overthinking it and maybe trying to be too helpful with the validation. Yeah. So, you know, this is the, the clippy validation problem. Oh, I see you're t trying to type an email address. Let me help you with that. That's probably not going to end well. So that's probably what's happening, over-aggressive validation. And someone's going, yeah, we're not, they're not going to just get rid of those trailing spaces on their own. They just, yeah. Yeah, a particularly common example of this that is actually annoying is validations that don't allow a plus symbol in the first part of the email address before the at sign. It's part of the standard and it's one of the edge cases that's quite useful. So if you have a Gmail address or many mail servers support having, you know, the first part of your email address, and then if you put a plus symbol, you can put anything you like between the plus symbol and the at sign, and it will still be delivered to the same mailbox. So this is very useful if you want to give out one-time email addresses. But yeah, not if your then online shop is then rejecting this plus symbol in the thing. So if you ever find yourself writing an error message in a software that says special characters not allowed, you are a bad person, and you should rethink your life choices, you should remember that Unicode is now 20 years old, and the there's just no reason for this anymore. And, and so that, that's the kind of thing that goes wrong. You know, that just somebody's made an assumption that was probably just fine about 40 years ago, but the world, well, it's not that the world got more complicated, but we've started to be more inclusive of the complexity of the world, which is a good thing. So keep up, people. Um, another question. Uh, there somewhere in the darkness. Over there at the back and then down here. Sorry, I did see. Thank you. Um, I wonder how you make the trade-off sometimes, like for example with addresses. Um, in the UK you can get around all those weird edge cases just by saying address line 1 and address line 2, right? Just make it a generic string, that works. Um, you could do the same for name, then you basically can deal with every single edge case in the world, maybe except for that one where someone has no name, but um, if you do that, then you can't for example, tailor your emails to that to that user. And I, I can just say, hello, Peter Hilton. I can't say, hi, Peter, or dear Mr. Hilton. Um, so if my competitor does register like uh, first name, last name, and gender, they may be able to better communicate with you, maybe not with 5% of their users, but better with 95% of their users, and they still might outcompete me in the market just because I have a nice single string that's technically easy and ideologically correct but i still get beaten in the market how, how do you deal with that okay so indeed it is a trade-off and that is the correct way to frame this everything is a trade-off and everything has a cost and a benefit start off with just saying hi and then look at your competitor and think it would be better if we could say hi peter so if you want to do that the wrong solution is to just kind of assume that it's only 5% of people it will go wrong because I think you just made that number up and that we don't really know and it's probably worse and have a separate field for this, this string. You know, have, leave the name alone and have a separate field for the salutation. And if that's too expensive, then don't do it. Make that trade-off, but don't build bad software based on this bad assumption, based on bad data about how serious it is. Um, if you had a physical shop, what percentage of people would you think is reasonable that they couldn't physically go through the door of the shop? There's pretty much no number that's okay. You know, excluding um, or, or not addressing people properly uh, to some percentage is as disrespectful as not allowing wheelchair users into a physical shop. Just make a different trade-off. Make the trade-off for sure, um, but, but have a better data model that allows you to um, capture the right information. I think that's the answer. Um, another question at the front, I think. And this should be the last one. It's, it's just a quickie. We, we did a lot of address parsing in a previous um, previous job. My favourite town, UK town that came, was Westwood Ho, with the exclamation mark at the end. Totally broke our system. <laughs> Wonderful, yes. Um, there's always an exception, especially, especially when it comes to place names in this country. 
Um, that's all we have time for today, but I'm here all day. And if you have more questions that you didn't want to say in front of everybody else, please just come and talk to me now. Um, I'm friendly. Uh, but otherwise, thank you for coming to my talk.